Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the new season of the AI and Data Show. My name is Matthew Holman. I'm a partner at Crips, and it's great to welcome you to our London studio. We are broadcasting live, and if you're new to this webinar, it's a 45-minute session where we take on all the fascinating things that are happening in the world of AI and data. We'll update you on all the latest things that are going on. Uh, we'll have some fantastic insights and interviews and uh, if you're an AI and data geek, this is the place for you to come and hang out. Um, it's a new season. We've had two months off, so we're about to start a whole new uh, session. We've got four episodes uh, between now and December, one on the first Monday of every month. Uh, today, we'll be looking at the question, what is artificial intelligence? Uh, and I'll be joined in the studio by Professor John DeMang. The, uh, the other sessions, just to let you know, uh, next month we'll be doing um, uh, a session entirely on the EU, getting your company ready for the EU AI Act. That's going to be great. And we'll be joined in the studio live by um, Lewis Borg, who is the uh, a principal in data protection at Unilever US. He'll be joining us from New York, talking about how all the things that Unilever has been doing to get itself ready. And uh, um, we'll be talking about how the things that you can be doing in your organization as well. After that, we'll be doing a session on AI and IP rights. There's some brilliant cases coming up on that. So we plan to tackle that thorny subject too. But today we have a jam-packed 45 minutes. We've got loads to get through. We're going to do a quick update on developments in the last two months. We're going to talk about, about the EU AI Act and the implementation timelines for that, just so that you're aware uh, when those timelines are. Then we'll be doing our main segment, asking the question, what is AI with John DeMang? And then we'll end with um, the AI elves talking about the great things that AI has been doing since we last met. However, before we start, I would like to introduce you to a brand new thing called See It, Say It, Saw It. Uh, this is um, a, for any of you who've ever been to a Matthew Holman show or live webinar or anything like that where you, where you see me speak um, in public, you'll know that I quite like doing gimmicky things where we saw businesses and organizations and other companies, uh, particularly where we find them doing things with data that uh, we don't like or possibly unlawful. Um, and uh, I wanted to show you this. Uh, this is me trying to buy Oasis tickets, the emphasis on the word trying. Um, and on uh, last week, I don't know if you remember, but we had um, the ability to get uh, onto the pre-sale ballot. And this is me on the pre-sale ballot website. Um, you'll see on the right-hand side, there's a box for email and another box that um, asks for you to consent. It's just going to zoom in on that box. Here it is. Asks for your email address. And then it says, I consent to Oasis sending me marketing communications by email. Now, um, any of us on the call who are experienced data protection practitioners, lawyers, um, DPOs, you all know that there needs to be two options. There can't just be one. And the box has turned red because I am trying to proceed without giving my consent and it won't let me. Very, very naughty, Oasis. Um, I did eventually consent and it takes you onto this other page. Uh, and that page, if I blow up uh, it takes a few more details. And then you get this box at the end as well, as if to add fuel to this non-compliance fire. I consent to Oasis sending me marketing communications by SMS, even if my number is on a do not call registry. Message frequencies vary. Message and data rates may apply a text stop to cancel. This is like a, um, a data protection 101 on how not to comply with the ICO's code of uh, practice with direct marketing and the uh, privacy and electronic communications regulations. Um, this is all exacerbated, I should add, by the fact that I didn't get Oasis tickets. So I'm feeling disgruntled and I'm feeling like my rights have been infringed. The question to you though, as the audience, is despite being faced with this flagrant breach of the rules and despite being a data protection practitioner, do you think we should sell them? So let's put it to a poll. Here it comes now. If you're watching live, please vote. Uh, we'll hold the vote open for just 30 seconds because we've got loads to get through. Do you think Matthew should saw the Oasis ticket sign, sign up production company? Um, I should add that we'll probably report them to the ICO as well, depending on the poll.
Okay. So we're just waiting. We'll give it a few more seconds. Excellent. Uh, I mean, it looks like everyone is saying yes, except for, I'm guessing the no is Liam and Noel Gallagher. Um, Liam, Noel, I'm terribly sorry. Um, you haven't given me any tickets, so I feel like we're going to have to take this to the next level. Um, let's, let's end the slides there. We'll come back to this, come back into the studio. Um, so, uh, so see it, say it, sorry, it's a bit of fun, but it's also designed to help teach us how to do compliance really well and how also not to do compliance. If you, as the beloved viewers and audience of the AI and data show, if you see and experience things in your daily life uh, where there is um, companies doing things that doesn't, don't comply with the law, then send us some examples. We'll take the best ones and we'll look into them and we'll keep updating you on See It, Say It, Saw It as we go through each um, month and come back next month to see what happened with Oasis, the ICO and the production company's non-compliance. Let's move on into the update section. Um, this is where we update you on all the interesting things that we've seen happen in the last four weeks, eight weeks even, since our last show. Um, so first on the list, uh, in, if you've missed it, I'll be very surprised, is that we have a new government since we all last met. Um, for those of you with really good memories, you'll know that we met on the Monday before the Thursday general election uh, as the last show. And since then, the Labour government and its sweeping majority have come to power. We don't know a great deal about what's happening with AI legislation. There isn't a lot that's been said other than the uh, Labour manifesto, which said that Labour will legislate for the most severe and harmful kinds of AI. Now, you might think, and indeed Labour would have us think, that that is a Labour initiative. It was actually buried deep in the Conservative, white pa conservative government white paper from February as well. So it's, it's new, but it's not that new. But all the same, it sounds like there is some law coming, but not uh, nothing like a general AI legislation that we've seen in the EU, at least not yet. On the 15th of July, the Hamburg Supervisory Authority published a fascinating decision into LLMs. Uh, LLMs are large language models. The uh, Hamburg Supervisory Authority is one of the 16 state authorities that make up the German um, data protection regulatory regime. And in that case, uh, it was fascinating for several reasons. The main one is that they concluded that LLMs don't process personal data. Now, I've only just managed to get my hands on a translated copy of the decision, so I haven't fully digested it myself. But what they seem to be suggesting from the case is that actually, if the LLM isn't processing a lot of personal data, then it might be the case that the GDPR doesn't apply or applies in a different way to LLMs. Expect more on that. Um, the next is uh, next update is emotional perception AI versus the UK Intellectual Property Office. That decision uh, was handed down on the 19th of July. Uh, this was on appeal from the High Court where the High Court basically said, we think that LLMs uh, and to be more precise, neural networks are not software, which is a really interesting thing for them to say. The reason they said it was because um, emotional perception were trying to patent the work of a neural network and they're trying to patent the network itself and, and various of its outputs the UK Intellectual Property Office Comptroller Patents was contesting this and saying, no, you can't, you can't patent software, and we think that this is software. That was what the whole case was about. On appeal, the Court of Appeal said, actually, we, we, will, we will allow the appeal, we will decide for the UK IPO because we think that uh, neural networks are software, they're just a very different kind of software. Interestingly, that's a great segue into what we're talking about later, but we'll, we'll come back to it. Fourth update is that uh, at the end of July, we had published the Digital Information and Smart Data Bill. So if you've missed that, definitely put it on your things to look at list. The Digital Information and Smart Data Bill is essentially the data protection and digital information number two bill that was canned at the end of the last parliament. Um, the write-up um, from uh, the Labour government would suggest it's a much more modified and advanced version of that bill. If that's the case, then exactly how is lost on me having read the extract. 
for example, it's doing all the same things to the ICO. It's going to revolutionize how the ICO functions, create a CEO, all of that stuff, plus all of the content on legitimate interests. It looks like it's in there as well. As and when that bill starts to progress, we will obviously bring you a lot more detail on it. Into August, and the EU AI Act became law on the 1st of August. So if you missed that, crikey almighty, get a post-it note out and write the EU AI Act is in force. Um, it is one month old today. And the ICO sent uh, 13 letters to, uh, or letters, I should say, to 13 social media companies on the 2nd of August. So the beginning of August was quite busy for AI and data geeks. This is a really interesting thing for the ICO to do because it comes on the back of a sting investigation where the ICO's tech team were um, setting up fake accounts and looking at these social media companies. I mean, it almost sounds a little bit like they were doing the stuff that we were doing on the AI show back in February and March. Hey, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery ICO. Thank you very much. The, um, uh, the outcome was just as good because the ICU sent letters saying uh, to, to all of these companies saying that they were not complying with the children's code. They were not setting uh, privacy settings to the maximum setting that they should do and a whole bunch of other things as well. Interestingly, though, the ICO hasn't named the companies, but I think we could probably guess who those 13 are. More on that as it happens. Uh, the Oxford Institute, the Oxford Internet Institute on the 7th of August published a paper called The Legal Duty of Truth. Now, this is fascinating. It's not the kind of thing I would normally bring, but I just wanted to put it on there in case you're interested in, in this kind of super geeky ethical stuff, just like I am. Um, I'll read you a very brief extract from the beginning of what is a fascinating paper. They say, careless speech is a new type of harm created by LLMs that poses cumulative long-term risks to science, education, and shared social truth in democratic societies. LLMs produce responses that are plausible, helpful, and confident, but that contain factual inaccuracies, misleading references, and biased information. This article examines the existence and feasibility of a legal duty for LLMs and their providers to tell the truth. Now, that leads into all kinds of brilliant debates like what is the truth and how do you, how do you possibly start to analyze things as complicated as that? For a really interesting take on it, uh, you could definitely look at the SCL David chapter write up on that. The last thing I'm going to bring to you is that uh, right at the end of August, as if we needed any more cherries on cakes of the world of AI and data protection, the ICO published its fifth consultation, uh, the fifth chapter in its generative AI consultation. The CRIPS team are pulling uh, together another response. We've already had our first meeting. There's a bunch of brilliant free thinkers, creative, uh, people working together to produce a response. This time, we'll, uh, the consultation asks us to look at the nature of controllers, processes, and joint controllers in the AI ecosystem. That is all the update we have. There is so much more that we could have put in the update, um, but we just don't have time. Most of you who are in the world of AI and data protection will pause and reflect that I haven't commented on the um, mega fine for Uber and international data transfers. That's because we're going to do a bit more on that next month. But essentially, Uber was hit with a uh, hundreds of million, I think it was 350 million euro fine for transferring personal data to the US in breach of um, article, um, whichever article it is, the GDPR it will come to me, article 44, um, which is the prohibition on international data transfers without a compliant mechanism. Um, so I think everything you know about international data transfers, this is a really great example. If you needed one for your organization, that you can pick up pretty chunky fines for not having your paperwork in order. But we'll, we'll do more on that next time. Now, before we move into our main section, I want to just very briefly show you um, the slide that we've produced on the EU AI Act because it arrived on the 1st of August, as I've already mentioned but it has a staggered implementation time. Hopefully you can see on the slides in front of you that. So it's in force as of the 1st of August, but it's not in effect, not yet. Here are the timelines. Uh, if you are concerned about prohibited AI practices, then the laws on that don't kick in until the 2nd of February next year. Uh, on the 2nd of May, some codes of practices should be published. Uh, and then uh, really the, the the next big date is the 2nd of August 2025, so a year after uh, 
uh, coming into force. The obligations on providers of general purpose AI kick in, that's LLMs to you and me. The provisions on infrastructure, notified bodies and governance kick in, as do the provisions on penalties. We then get a whole other year uh, of staggered implementation up to the 2nd of August, at which point it's in full effect. So if you are um, a provider of low risk AI, uh, as, as we've talked about previously on the show, then by the 2nd of August, that's when you absolutely will need to, to have your house in order. Clearly, please don't wait until then. If we learn anything from the 25th of May 2018 in all things GDPR, it's that waiting until the deadline is a pretty poor thing to do. But if your organisation wants to know how long it's got, the answer is on the screen in front of you. Let's come back into the room and move on to our main feature because when we were planning this session one of the main things that we had in the feedback was uh, some time to explain what what actually is ai how does it work how do we even know what it is and how do we start explaining it to our clients what do we do when we're in the room with computer geeks and they're talking at us in what feels like um, a completely indecipherable language um, to to tackle that we thought we would um, bring on someone who really is a specialist in all of this stuff. Uh, and it is uh, my great pleasure to introduce to all of you, Professor John DeMang. John, Hello. welcome to the studio. Uh, it is um, a real honor to have you here. John is a, a preeminent AI academic in the UK. He's the professor of computer science and AI at the Open University. He specializes in artificial intelligence and blockchain. Uh, until recently, he was uh, the head of the OU's Knowledge uh, Media Institute, and he has many published articles on all things AI, web, and blockchain. John, not just those things, but it is customary that all guests of the show are asked some embarrassing and stupid icebreaker questions. Is it okay if I ask you some questions? Okay, thank you. Excellent. As an AI professor, would you rather wear a tweed jacket and monocle or a baseball cap and shades? I wouldn't want to be seen dead in a tweed jacket and monocle. I often wear sunglasses, shades and a baseball cap. You wouldn't want to be seen dead in a monocle or tweed jacket. Well, exactly. the thank you monocle that we bought you will be ditched very shortly and sent back to the packs of Amazon. If the AI you've developed had a personality, would it be more like a strict teacher, a stand-up comedian or a laid-back friend? It will be your best ever laid back friend. Best ever laid back friend. Mm. Excellent. If you could program an AI to do one of your daily chores, which one would it be? And what funny twist would you add to its program? So the chore I least like doing is putting out the trash, <laughs> which I'm solely responsible for. Yeah, yeah. But I would do it in a proper AI way, actually building on work we've done, where the trash would be intelligent. So every item when it's manufactured would be smart. And it would talk to the robot as it put out, sort me, this is how you sort me, this is my use date. And it would talk to the bin lorry, to the, the, the people picking up your trash would know how much trash exactly, um, uh, how it can be recycled or not, et cetera. So that's what I would do. Fascinating. I can almost feel um, George Orwell turning in his grave as we think about that. What is the most bizarre or unexpected thing you've seen an AI program do? So, so one of them was in the early days. So I started out in the early 80s doing my PhD on AI at the Open University. And I came into the office one day, uh, logged into my, my own machine, and it said, hi, John, happy birthday. And I went around to my friends saying, oh, who's hacked my machine to make it say happy birthday to me? And their responses were all, we didn't know it was your birthday and we didn't care. So then I realized that the machine itself was more friendly than my so-called <laughs> colleague in the lab. And I hope you ditched those friends fairly soon after that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've definitely passed our test. I should add that every one of those questions was written by an LLM, which feels like a very good segue into our session on explaining what on earth AI is. Now, for those of you who feel like you need an absolute primer, super duper basic idiot's guide, this is um, an introduction slide that we've got for you. So uh, most of the description here is taken from the uh, case I mentioned earlier, the Emotional Perceptions versus UK IPO case from July. The first thing you need to know is that neural networks are not new. Um, they were actually designed in the 50s and they've been around in various forms since then. Uh, a neural network is a machine 
which processes information in a different way to normal software. Software is a program, uh, software programs are defined as a set of instructions that tell a computer what to perform. They are quite literally if then statements. If you were writing software code, what you're really doing is saying, if this, then that, if that, then this, and so on. A neural network contains neurons which receive and process information and are connected together with things that are a bit like synapses. In that way, they're quite different to software programs. Each neuron has a weight and a bias that is applied to it to produce an output. The neural network doesn't consist of if-then statements at all. Instead, it is trained, giving it the means to decide the output itself. Software solves tractable problems, meaning things that we can identify. Neural networks solve intractable problems, meaning things that are hard to know or identify. Now, if you're a pictures person rather than a words person, this graph might help. On the top line, we have traditional software we've uh, represented as a problem. That problem is resolved by a programmer and she is deciding uh, what to do. She knows what the parameters are and she's got the time to write code. That is then converted into hardware that makes uh, a very literal computer with wires and switches and everything else and software on top of that functioning on a server that creates output. With a neural network, we start in the same place. So we have a problem and a programmer, but she doesn't know here what the parameters are and she doesn't know exactly what answer she's looking for. Instead, what she does is go through this cycle method of training a program through repetitive uh, training exercises. And that program, if you like, lives in a black box. Here it's obviously different to hardware and software because you can't really see the difference between the two. And they produce an output. Now the output is the same color as the one above, but the shape is very different because it's a totally different kind of output. Now that is a very rough, simple explanation of the difference between re regular software and neural networks. And that brings us back into the studio and, um, and to John. John, before we start jumping into really detailed questions about neural networks, can you tell me a little bit about your background? How did you get into all of this in the first place? And what is it about, about AI that fascinates you so much? So I was an undergrad at the University of Warwick doing computer science. And I read an amazing book one summer, um, um, uh, Godel Escherbach, The Eternal Golden Braid by Douglas Hofstadter, which I would recommend to everyone. It's a very easy read. And he really connects Godel's mathematics with Bach's amazing music and um, Escher's um, self-referential drawings and uses that to give insights into knowledge and intelligence. So I read that and I saw an advert for a PhD at the Open University, uh, which I went. And there I met some really amazing people. Uh, Judy Green, the head of the psychology lab, who is a, a white Jamaican whose father was in the House of Lords, and Mark Eisenstadt, whose own PhD supervisor was Don Norman, who designed the Google interface for search. And they both really instilled in me that there are no limits. The only limits one has um, in life and work are the ones you impose on yourself. And being there with those two inspirational people and being in Milton Keynes, a few miles from the road from where Alan Turing was, um, um, building the first computers and decoding and everything was just very inspiring. So I really got hooked uh, from there. I love it. I mean, we could just pause and talk about that for the rest of the show. <laughs> Loving the shout out to Milton Keynes, by the way. and. Um, uh, and the idea that the only limitation is the one you put on yourself, mm. that must have been really powerful. Um, most of the people on the other side of the camera are lawyers or data protection officers or people in compliance or um, even students, typically not engineers, not technologists, not software um, people or computer programmers. We are definitely aspiring tech heads. We want to understand how these things work. So that will better enable us to talk to our clients about the problems they're facing and the things coming down the line. With that in mind, could you explain to the audience what the different kinds of AI are? So I would say there's two main camps in, in AI. So we're engineers mm -hmm. trying to build an artificial brain, an artificial mind. And like many engineers, we're, we have been inspired by nature. 
So the, the, most, the best example of an intelligent thing on the planet are people who are smart. And there are two main um, viewpoints from there. One comes from psychology, um, especially cognitive psychology, where their basic theory, if you were to put it into one line, is that we're intelligent in our mind because we manipulate symbols. Mm -hmm. We're symbol processing symbol, uh, systems. Um, and in, you can think about intelligence as putting these symbols, mother, cat, dog, father, and they have relationships between them. And there's a whole camp of work on those. The best example in, in where you can see this is in Google search, actually. So behind Google search is a huge uh, connected graph of symbols related to searches. So if you type in London, you'll get the location and the weather and pictures. If you type in Milton Keynes, you get another set. And if you type in anything, that's because they have a, a, a big symbol system there. The other inspiration is the human brain. And there are people saying, okay, the human brain is a set of neurons that are connected. So we'll make a brain. Uh, um, and we can even do that in software. A lie to that is something that you mentioned earlier, which is machine learning. So machine learning um, is an element of computer science, I would say, is I think about as being lazy. So the goal of a computer scientist is to not do anything, but to get the machine to do everything. So rather than spending months or years writing computer code that can be buggy, um, and there are some famous bugs, get the machine to write its own code. And we do that over, a, over um, this very laughably simple model of the human brain. Now on the screen, for those of you who uh, can see the screen share, there, are, uh, there is a slide um, demonstrating neural networks. John, just talk us through how a neural network works and it, its training. Sure, so the human brain has 100 billion neurons and trillions of connections between them. So here I have uh, nine. I have a human brain with nine nodes, nine neurons, and um, there are connections and the connections can change in their strength. And there's one input at the top. There are some layers, there's two layers, and then there's one output at the bottom. So in goes a number and out goes a number. And I want to train this to draw the graph on the right. So the input will be an X coordinate, and then the, uh, the bottom will be a Y coordinate for this simple step graph. So if you go to the next slide. And so what we do, being the lazy computer scientists, is we just give examples. We give uh, um, examples of good X coordinates and good Y coordinates. And then the, the strength of the connections, which we call weights, change in the graph. And I have four um, timelines um, in this slide. So you can see on the far left, when we presented 10,000 examples, the poor thing hasn't learned anything, really. And even after 100,000, he hasn't learned much. But by a million, you get the emergence of something which is close to the graph I desire. And then by the far right, 10 million examples. The, the, the strength of the links has changed, and it's now drawing the, the right graph. So how does, it, how does it learn? If you go to the next slide, please. So I have the same uh, uh, graphs at the bottom from 10,000 to 10 million examples. And at the top, I'm showing something called the loss function. So the loss function you can think of as when you, um, when you explain to a child that's trying to find something in the room, is it close to the thing or is it far? So you say hotter and colder. So the Y axis is how hot or cold you are and the X axis is time. So if you're at the top, if you're high, you're cold. And if you're at the bottom, you're warmer. So as you see, as you go along and give up to 10 million examples, um, the, the, the network gets warmer and then the weights are closer to what we, they need to be to draw the right graph. So on that graph that we're looking at there, on the top line, uh, the, the top four, you've got this orange, orangey red line with the, the dot moving further down. On the, on the left of that, it's cold exactly on the right it's much warmer and um, and on the bottom you can see the graph changing as the dot moves above it and on the right at that point there are 10 million Exam examples so that so the amount of training that that particular system in that example would need is 10 million examples to, yeah. to have learned 
what the right output is. So back in the, in our introductory slide, when when the programmer comes up with a problem and says to the LLM or uh, network neural network, how do I fix this? It will be the ten millionth and first time it's seen it, and the answer is contingent on the ten million preceding attempts, something like that. If 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 you think about ChatGPT, it's read the entire web. Mm. So the examples has been given is the entire web and is and it's guessing the next word. Mm. So it's had a lot of examples to guess in the next word. Uh, and what a high quality source the entire internet would have been. <laughs> no comments. Uh, we have time for questions because the event is live and uh, we want you guys to have the ability to to learn for yourselves as well. Um, then you can fire as many questions as you like at our expert John. Um, those questions will hopefully appear um on here somewhere uh excellent and we have some questions already if you've got any questions now is the time get yourself into the q a type something up it will appear on this uh, tablet in front of me by the magic of technology and um i will put your question to john uh, the first question i've got though is how long does it take to train a neural network that's a good question it can take um a few months and it costs okay. in the early days is of uh, one million or ten million dollars, and now they're talking about uh, it costing ten billion. Gosh, uh, uh, dollars. Wow, one to ten to train. That's a lot of so, funding. Yeah. Why do you think it's important, tech? Uh, why do you think it's important tech now, and how quickly are things moving? So why is this tech important now, and how quickly is it moving? Yeah. So as I said, I started on this in the nineteen eighties. Um, and every once in a while, there's a big jump. Mm. So we basically, engineers, we're experimenting. Mm. And there was a paper that came out from Google, you can find it online, called All You Need Is Attention. Mm. And it was a new architecture that had promising results. Mm. And then from there, things are moving very quickly. Every week, I would say, there's, a, there's an update for the geeks. There are some brilliant questions pouring in. Should we be worried about an AI winter? and a lack of usable data for AI models in the short to medium future? Great question. So I've been through two AI winters, so <laughs> I, I, I know that. I, I think it's now too embedded. Yeah. So you know, if you watch something online, if you listen to music online, if you bank, uh, your car has at least 8 million lines of code. Mm. So it's now, there's, it's, I don't think, famous last words, I don't think there's going to be another We're AI. past the point of no return I on think all things so. AI. Yeah. Um, which of these to pick? Um, clearly, you're the guest that the audience wanted. <laughs> um, when going through the entire web, how does AI differentiate between facts, correct, incorrect, and what is ethically good to provide the model? So the simple answer to that is it does it not. Doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> it, it doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't. It does not. There, there are there are mechanisms one can do. So, for example, what we do at the Open University like many others, when we're using it for teaching, is you say, please answer this question. And when you answer this question, use my documents that I've curated and not the web mm. that you learn. So it's good to think about these machines as good translators and not sources of knowledge. Mm. So it understands the English and other languages, but it's not a source of knowledge. Oh, just pause and think about that for a second. It's a good translator, but it's not a source of knowledge in itself. Mm. Um, that is definitely something that could be highly debated. I mean, I know there are other writers and people out there saying no to that or saying, if not now, then maybe it will be at a point in yes. time. Uh, I feel like if we yeah. did that, this would go on for about three hours as opposed to the 10 minutes that we have left. Um, another question is, do you think losing control of AI is a threat to humankind? No, is the short answer. <laughs> it, 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 the problem is that when we one interacts, it seems human-like, but it's not a human. Mm. It's a machine mimicking that has no... It's mimicking a human in a very narrow sense. It mm. has no innate goal, except which has been programmed. It has no desire. So the, the Terminator uh, view is, is, is not there. It's in no more than your watch or your car is going to take over the world. Um, We've got time for a couple more questions, by the way. If you want to put any questions to John, please do fire them in the Q&A and I will put
put them to our expert. One of them, uh, another question that's coming is, what do you think the world will look like in five to 10 years time? Yeah, and, uh, I think Bill Gates once said that um, we underestimate the changes over 10 years, but overestimate the changes over five years. Mm -hmm. so, so I think um, it, it's, everybody is going to have an infinite army of interns mm -hmm. if you're doing knowledge work. That you will be and you will learn at school how to train your infinite army of interns. <laughs> that will unleash everybody for extra creativity. That's my, my. What advice would you give to a budding young lawyer? Um, learn how to work with your systems and play with them. Mm. The best way to learn is to play. So mm. get yourself access and play with it. Make sure that you're, you're not putting anything confidential in there. <laughs> Indeed. That, that play. That play with it. Excellent. Um, we'll wrap up the Q&A there, but thank you very much to everyone who um, put their questions in. If you do have any other questions, then please fire them in anyway, and we will uh, come back. We'll, we'll try and find a way of getting answers to you. Um, we'll lock John in the studio, and we won't let him out until he's typed a response and sent it to you. Um, we're going to end the session with John uh, in an unusual way because John actually wanted to ask me a question. I don't think we've done that on any previous AI data show, but John, um, what was your question? What is the law? What is the law? That is a tough question. That's a massive question. Um, what is the law? I think I mean, the, the law is a form of, I really like Barack Obama's answer to something like this question in his book audacity of hope which is a great book i would thoroughly recommend and um he he basically says law is a law is a the story of a nation arguing with itself about its own conscience it's trying to express its own conscience uh, and it does it through it does it through cases it does it through documentation it does it through just the, the expression of justice all of those things are our law i suppose i mean i, I feel like I could have come up with a better answer to that, but I didn't have time. Yeah, so the reason I asked that question is with any big technological change, you have to go back to first principles. So if you think about going from uh, plays in theatres to movies, you have mm. to think about what it is you're trying to do. The internet changed how we communicate. AI will change what knowledge is and how you represent knowledge. Mm. So I think people have to rethink what law is in relation to knowledge. So just to unpack that a little bit, do you mean that do you mean that the way we think about how we apply law will change, or do you mean actually the law itself will change? Law itself. So law is, will no longer be a set of documents. It might be a set of weights mm. in a large neural network in mm. 20 years' time. <laughs> uh, what an incredible thing to think about. And, and how on earth? How on earth do you do a degree in that? Will there even be law degrees, or will there just will they all be law and computer science degrees running side by side with each other? I think every in the same way there are some basic things, skills one needs to have to be a lawyer. Hmm. Um, AI will be part of the basic training, wow. either at school or in, in in university. So there's a possibility that in future people won't have to do real estate exams, but they will have to do. AI exams. That would be fantastic yeah. for all of us that don't like real estate. Kidding to all of you real estate lawyers. We, we love you and we need you. Um, thank you, John, very much for coming on the show and giving up your time. We end every show by spending some time with our AI elves who do all of the research and hard work that goes into the planning and prep behind this show. We're indebted to them. They're a fantastic bunch of people and um, We've got one AI health in the studio with us today. Uh, welcome, James. Thank you, Matt. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's great to have you here. James is a new AI health, uh, although he has been on the scene for a little while. And um, the other AI elves are on holiday and poorly. So have fun and get better, respectively. Um, it's great to have you here. Though, and I'm sure their absence isn't any reflection on your being here at all. I like to hope not. <laughs> What have you seen AI doing in the last two months that's fascinated you as we've been doing the research? Anything really interesting you want to report to the beloved viewer? Yeah, so I found a couple of really interesting ones, one scientific and one not so scientific. So on the scientific side, uh, research at the University of Toronto have been using AI to help identify uh, metal combinations for producing hydrogen fuel. 
Okay. And they used the system specifically to narrow down 36 potential combinations, uh, sorry, 36,000 potential combinations wow. to only one. Wow. Um, and they were able to find something that's more stable and durable than what they currently have. Amazing. Um, which could be very good from an R&D cost perspective and time perspective. Um, but also have benefits. exactly yeah, absolutely um and then also ai generated recipes which is slightly less scientific <laughs> and have had very varying degrees of success um so a supermarket in new zealand used ai uh, to generate meal plans with leftovers amazing and they started out with oreo vegetable stir fries uh, and ended up with ant poison and glue sandwiches <laughs> um, and subsequently they've been used by restaurants to make a pizza topped with shawarma chicken, paneer cheese, za'atar herbs, and tahini, <laughs> and the slightly less popular uh, strawberry and pasta pizza. What? So <laughs> hopefully these will act as uh, a very good reminder to check your outputs before using them. So let me just get this straight. Um, <laughs> I can't even remember what half of those were. They were that bad. Terrible recipes from... Um, AI programs that are concocting ways to make things with food waste, yep. something along those lines, or um, University of Toronto doing brilliant things with science to help find hydrogen, which is clearly beneficial to all of us. Yep. Um, as is tradition, we're going to go back to our guest, uh, John. Which of those two things do you think is best? I'm a lover of food. <laughs> so I also imagine connecting it to a smart fridge and then training on Michelin chefs. Uh, <laughs> that would be great. That sounds crazy. And I can't believe that the scientist isn't picking the scientific one, but well done. Good, to, good for you, John. That is uh, pretty much the end of the show. All, it, uh, all that does is leave me to um, say thank you very much to you, the viewer, for giving up time to come and hang out with us. I hope you've enjoyed it. We'll be back on Monday, the 7th of October, 2024 at half past 12 when we will have special guest Lewis Borg who is a data protection uh, officer and um, principal at Unilever based in New York he'll be joining us uh, live streaming to talk about all the things that Unilever an amazing organization uh, has been doing to get ready for the EU AI Act and we'll be talking about the things that you can do in your organization to get ready as well we'll also be doing um, more updates uh, so all the things that have happened between September to October. And of course, I will feed back to you on see it, say it, saw it. And what on earth did the ICA have to say about Oasis and their blatant, flagrant non-compliance with um, GDPR, PECA and all those other good direct marketing laws. Thank you to John DeMang for coming on the show and a big shout out to the open university that amazing institution doing incredible work in all its disciplines if you haven't checked out the ou then please do and thank you to uh james our AIL, for uh, coming on and giving us his updates until october have a fantastic rest of your month thank you very much for tuning in see you soon